Yes, today is um, April 22nd, 2013. My name is Nancy Bu. I am going to interview uh, Colonel Milen Huynh. Uh, good evening. <laughs> good evening, Kay. <laughs> yeah. uh, could you please tell us about your name and your profession? Oh, um, I'm La Milan Huynh, mm -hmm. and uh, I serve uh, in the Air Force f as a physician for 21 years. Wonderful. Uh, and what is your rank now? I am a colonel. Yes. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Uh, could you tell us uh, what, what exactly Colonel Milan Huynh do, does in, in um, Air Force? Uh, I'm currently the director of the Air Force International Health Specialist Program, and we have um, personnel assigned to work with partner nation militaries to build their capacity to share information so that we could work together if we need to, to make us more interoperable. Wonderful. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your family before 1975, your sibling, parent, and so on? I am uh, a second child of a family of uh, four children. My parents, uh, my dad served in the South Vietnamese Army as a physician. My mom um, was working as a pharmacist. And my older sister, my older sister Sylvie, younger brother, uh, Apollo, that's his nickname, and a younger sister, Bambi, <laughs> that's her nickname as well. Um, before 75, my dad um, served in the South Vietnamese Army, as I mentioned, so he um, worked as a physician to take care of the South Vietnamese soldier, and was gone quite a bit. I remember him being gone and then coming back from his mission. Uh, we live in a city um, north of Saigon, Nha Trang. Uh, so I remember a lot of great times at the beach, spending a lot of time trips uh, going to uh, Nha Trang Beach, uh, eating uh, tofu tau hu, <laughs> and um, just really wonderful time. I live with my grandparents. Can you continue uh, from you would enjoy the beach of Nha Trang so much? Yes, it is a lot of trips to uh, the beach, even go out to the islands on occasion. Um, I just remember just wonderful memories before 1975. Of course, there were scary parts. You know, we sometimes would go to school and hear about um, you know, our friends who have lost a family member. So, of course, there was just um, sporadic, those scary stories that come up. So before 75, I had a you know, vision of the Viet Cong looking like gorilla. Uh, that, you know, because of the description, the stories I heard about uh, the Viet Cong was just so um, you know, barbaric that uh, you know, as a child you had this image of them that of course is not true, that you know, unfold after 75 when they came in. Yeah. Uh, well, your dad was a physician who served the South Vietnamese Army. Does that mean, uh, I mean, influence you in any way now that you are what you are right now? Oh, I think so. I think growing up uh, with a dad who's a physician, a mom who's a pharmacist, you are surrounded by, you know, health, right, medicine. But um, my parents never uh, push me to go toward medicine. Maybe they did it in a subliminal way, but I didn't recognize it. Um, they, I think, put more pressure on my brother. He was, you know, the only son. They can't, I think they let the girls choose what they want to do. My older sister is a fashion designer, and uh, I remember coming home um, from college. I was at University of Virginia, and I was trying to decide between nursing and uh, medical school. So I asked my dad, what does he think I should do? And he said, well, you're a girl. You uh, should just get married and be happy. <laughs> so, and because he said that, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to medical school. <laughs> no, no, I always wanted to be in a profession to help people. And I think um, I have a little bit of uh, stubbornness in me that I don't like people telling me what to do. I like to make my own decision. So I thought maybe uh, being a doctor would be more suited <laughs> than a nurse. But you know, both uh, equally um, you know respected profession. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. 
Do you still have um, any memory of April 1975 when the event unfolded? How was it and the atmosphere of the people on the street from your opposition? Yeah, so um, about a month before April 30th, 1975, my um, parents took us into Saigon uh, to live with my um, paternal grandmother, Banoi, because we knew that the Viet Cong was getting closer to Nha Trang and Saigon would be the last place that would fall. So we uh, went to Saigon and, and lived there and took shelter there. Um, the night before the 30th, I guess the night of the 29th, um, my family, my parents took, you know, all four of us, plus my aunt, probably uncle, we went to the U.S. Embassy in Saigon because I think everybody thought if you go there that the U.S. would evacuate us out. But we went there, there was thousands and thousands of people all, you know, probably with the same idea, very chaotic, everybody was, you know, banging on the fence trying to get into the embassy. Um, at night, I think someone threw a tear gas, so the crowd dispersed. And I remember holding on to my uh, aunt's hand, and luckily we all regather, regroup at some point, and then so we just went home. And the next day, I, uh, watched the, you know, we all watched the Viet Cong march into Saigon. What yeah. do you feel when you see Viet Cong march into Saigon? It, it's strange, believe it or not. I felt when I saw them, remember when I said, well, as a child, I thought that the Viet Cong looked like animal, gor gorillas, based on the barbaric stories or the horrific story I heard. So when we saw them walk in, march in with the tanks, and they look just like us. They, they look like Vietnamese people. I thought, oh, how strange that they're not like animals because how I had this um, you know, image in my mind. I learned later that it's called terror management theory, meaning that we, when we as people, when we're uh, close to death, where you're so fearful for your life, we tend to have create an identity that of the fear that's so different from us. So I think as a child, as a way to deal with the terror, I had an image that the Viet Cong were animals. Mm -hmm. So strangely, I felt you know almost a relief that you know they're not animals. I mean, they may have done horrible things, but they actually look like us. Yeah. Well, that's true because I interviewed some of the younger who came out from Vietnam recently, and they saw the South Vietnamese, uh, the former South Vietnamese soldier and officer who were former or prisoner in Vietnam, and she saw and said, "Oh, they fine. Why, when she went into school, they always betray them like a rapist mm. and you know monster in some sort." Right. So. You know, both sides, the propaganda. The yes, that's them. right. Image in our head. Mm -hmm. Yes. The children, my. Right. Yeah. How was your life in Vietnam after Saigon fell? So after Saigon fell, we uh, took a um, you know big trip back to Nha Trang because that's where we live, and my mom had brought in all her medication from her pharmacy on a boat. So we had to take it all back on a big truck. And I remember the roads were very difficult. As you can imagine, everything you know was destroyed. And it was a very arduous trip where there was no um, facilities. I remember we would stop alongside the road and you know it was time to go to the bathroom and but you couldn't go far into the field because the field of landmines. So we would just you know, go right there next to the truck, you couldn't go. And it was a very scary trip because everybody was making the same trip. And as soon as we got back to Nha Trang, um, my dad had to report to the, you know, official because the words went out, if you serve in the Viet South Vietnamese Army, you have to go and report in. So he did, and then he got taken away to uh, what they call re-education camp. My mom um, took care of four of us, uh, reopened her pharmacy. Um, but I, after 75, there's definitely a sense of gloom, a sadness. You know, I, I don't recall hearing much laughter. 
In fact, you know, all the uh, flowers that we used to have in our flower bed around the house were pulled out. We have to plant vegetables because we were told you have to plant things that could be eaten. You know, there's no beauty. You, everything has to be practical. Um, I remember at school, uh, sometimes you were asked, you know, what, what do your parents do? What do you think? So, you know, thinking back, of course, we were, they were, teachers were prying us for information about our family. As a child, you didn't know better, so you would just tell the truth about what's going on at home. I remember we had to wear the red uh, kerchief, um, and there was obligatory, you know, uh, cleaning of the roads and street every week. I remember my mom having to go to um, community meetings. Um, the Communist Party organized certain meetings that everybody had to go. And she would go to uh, those meetings, but there was this sense of sadness. Um, I remember there are a lot of chaos surrounding um, you know, exchange of currency because with the Communist Party, you, they want everybody to be equal. So there was a series of a currency exchange, a lot of panic, um, food shortages. We began uh, supplementing rice with potato, adding potato to rice. But luckily, I love potato, <laughs> so that was fine. Um, and then just very difficult time. I remember even one point where we didn't even have toothpaste. So we had to brush our teeth with a straw. You know, you how you cook rice and burn woods, and there was the straw from that, the ashes. We would use that as friction to brush our teeth. So there was shortages of everything, um, sense of sadness, worrisome. But I also get sense that you know people were working together, that the community, the the, um, the city of Nyajang, people did try to help each other. Um, but def definitely, uh, you know, a lot of fear in the air. What do you think about the sense of sadness? Where does it come from? I think... Um, we in the peace time, you know, it, no, no more war, no more bomb. Why is fear? Yeah, well, I think our freedom was lost. There was no freedom. There was a fear that uh, we didn't know what... The men were all taken away, right? So nobody knew what happened to my father. Um, there was a sense of, uh, you know, not enough of anything. There's not enough food. Um, there's a sense of, you know, if you say the wrong thing, maybe you too could be taken away. So there was no free expression. And uh, there's certainly no laughter like before. Uh, you know, where people would have jokes and there would be sense of, you know, joy and, and happiness. You just didn't see that. How is that um, atmosphere among friends the um, same age with you, your classmate? Yeah, how were they in terms of... Yeah, uh, in terms of how you are gathering what you talk about and how was it still yeah. the same like before? How that, well, when you know, I was eight or nine years old, so I think my immediate thing was just, you know, I didn't... I don't remember having conversation about this with them, but certainly I, I think that we were scared. We couldn't talk about it because I don't know, I don't think we were, we realized that we were scared. I know that a lot of my um, friends lost family members, so they were scared or they didn't know what happened to their father or their uncle as well. Um, but, you know, we went to school, there was recess and the communists did did institute mandatory uh, physical education, so every morning we had to exercise. So that was different for us, where you know we had to wear you know a white dress. And I remember trying to okay, how do I do this with the dress on? Um, so things were different, but I think as an eight-year-old, we just you know try to find comfort in each other. Oh, do you remember you had had any uh, difficulty because your father was in prison? Any discrimination among? from school board or from anyone? No, I don't remember that because uh, Nha Trang, you know, well, most people, have, every family probably had the same situation where their dad or their uncle were taken away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hi, Sydney. Okay. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> mm -hmm.
Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> I have an audience right here. That's so right. <laughs> That's right. Okay, and uh, can you uh, share your um, you and your family uh, journey to freedom? Yeah. So during that one year after '75, my mom. She's so smart. She had planned, you know, the Viet Cong really encouraged everyone to be self-sufficient. So it encouraged you to be farmers, right, plant vegetables. It encouraged you to be fishermen. So my mom um, got together with some friends to other families, and they chipped in. They bought uh, two fishing boats. And my uncle then um, were, you know, learning to be fishermen, I guess, pretending to learn to be fishermen. And her plans all along were when my dad got out of prison, that we would leave Vietnam. So a year later, um, my dad was pardoned, I guess, as a physician. He delivered care in the concentration camp, so they let him out on probation a year later. And that's really early, because I heard that's very unusual. Um, so they let him out, and I believe that following weekend, um, I remember my parents uh, waking us up and say, it's, it's time to go, we're going to go to an island. Because before 75, we used to do that. We would take a boat trip out to one of the islands for the weekend. And so they woke us up, say, just get your bathing, under your bathing suit, get a float, and we're going to go to um, an island for the weekend to celebrate Dad's return. So um, I did just that, got up. Um, went out to uh, you know, walk along the street. We even got uh, in a sit low. And back then there was a curfew where you couldn't leave the house before five o'clock. And in Nha Trang, everybody um, goes to, most everybody goes to the beach early in the morning before the sunrise, because you know how we don't like to get <laughs> sun on your skin. Um, so at four o'clock, my parents uh, woke us up and they uh, were so smart, they set their watch an hour ahead so that if they were stopped by uh, you know the patrol or uh, the soldier they would say oh you know my watch must be wrong we thought it's five o'clock it's time to go to the beach um, so we got to the uh, ocean and uh, I didn't know this until several years ago when I went back to Nyatran with my parents they show us the exact spot where we took off and it's right in front of Pasteur Institute of Nyatran and Pasteur Institute had this floodlight that shined right into the building, so it creates a blind spot on the beach. And that's because of the light. So I always tell my French friends that, you know, thank you to Pasteur Institute, keep paying the electric bill. <laughs> because, of, because of that blind spot, uh, allow us to uh, leave. And basically, my uncle had the fishing boat waiting, and we swam from shore to the boat. Um, and then just took off, oh, and wow. there was patrol. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> a couple hundred feet. We yes. swam out, but I had a, a float. My, I have a four-year-old sister, who my mom helped. But I remember just swimming by myself out into the boat, and my uncle just pull us up onto the boat. But I had no fear at that time because I really thought we were going to an island. You know, had my parents told us that we were escaping, I would think I would be so, so scared. Um, so that moment of leaving was almost joyful until we got on the boat and you know went out to sea. It was a very small boat, very rough, rough sea. We started out with two fishing boats. As you know, in Vietnam, people fish with two boats with the net in the middle. And the first night, one of the engine, um, we lost you know the engine of one boat the boat that carried all the water and oil. So we had to figure out how to transfer everybody, including water and oil, to uh, the second boat. Um, but also the first night, my dad saw, we saw a, a large ship, and we thought maybe we were out in international water. So my dad used his um, you know, flare his, from the army day to you know, signal distress. And all the women children were told to lay down, cover with blanket, and the boat did come. They came around to basically look at us, and they saw that the engine was still running, and they just turned around and laughed. My parents told us that we were very fortunate because it turned out that the, that ship had a Russian flag. So had they bored, they would have known that we were trying to escape, but they saw that we were fine. We had, the engine was still working, they laughed. So the next morning, we transferred everything to one 
boat and then um, six night at sea and we arrive at the Philippines. And you know, we probably had angel guiding us along the way because I remember uh, I was sick most of the time, but the moments I was not sick, I would see dolphins uh, jumping along our boats. And uh, when we got close to the Philippines, uh, we met up with some fishermen who exchanged uh, us. Uh, we had beer, we gave them some Vietnam, Vietnam beer and they gave us some fish and show us the way to um, uh, the Manila Philippines and we actually bought, docked a boat right in a central park of Manila a couple blocks from the US Embassy I didn't know this until I returned to the Philippines a couple of years ago where we would and I remember we um, were right next to this huge ship that looks like a love boat you know <laughs> it was just a magnificent ship and I looked up and there was all these people with beautiful gowns there was all these lights and music so I thought maybe we all die and went to heaven because of these beautiful <laughs> beautiful ship um, so when we landed in the Philippines my uh, dad and uncle got off the boat and went and looked for help because we've been on the boat um, for so long all of us were sick we didn't eat enough and uh, probably looked very frail and so my dad couldn't walk straight right because you, after you've been on boat for so long you can't get, walk straight so he stopped by a policeman and said we um, hi I'm a refugee and we're here se seeking refuge in the Philippines and they thought he was drunk <laughs> so they had, they made my dad do the uh, you know uh, alcohol straight line walk and everything finally they believe us went back to the boat and then they called the Red Cross who brought in you know rice and water and then the next day we uh, went to the refugee camp how do you feel when you were there waiting for your dad going to try to get the help what, what went into your mind at that time you know I um, Halfway through the boat ride, when I woke up from my seasickness, I asked my dad, where is this island? Why is it taking so long for us to get there? And he said, well, we're going to America. And I always had this beautiful vision of America being like paradise. My dad actually went to San Antonio for training, um, part of the U.S. Army training. And he, I remember seeing a picture of him holding snow, a pic and he brought back a beautiful doll. So I always thought, oh, America, it's so beautiful. Um, I think when I was probably waiting for my dad, I was probably mesmerized by that boat, <laughs> that huge ship next to a little small boat, and just uh, seeing the glitters and the beautiful lights. Yeah. So you don't live uh, in the uh, Philippines that long? Uh, Just two months in a refugee right. camp and then we came to, to Dale City, Virginia, not far from here where Potomac Mills is now. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. so how, Big shopping. How was the time in Philippines? You got a chance to learn English or anything? Yeah, they, there was English classes. I remember my uh, sister and brother and I would just love to explore the refugee camp and there was never enough to eat you know every family gets certain ration we all we had um, a mat in a corner of a room and um, we were actually placed in Mandaluyong which is a uh, very tightly secure psychiatric hospital and for the uh, Vietnamese refugee in 75 they clear out the uh, psychiatric hospital to hold us so it's basically a room you know probably the size of this and there was just lots of family everybody just basically have a mat but you know we didn't mind it we thought it was fun um, and we explore things I didn't realize that Mendalu Young has such a you know a, a crazy it's a crazy name in the Philippines you know if you go to, to um, uh, the Philippines, you say you were at Mandaluyong, they, they think you have a severe psychiatric <laughs> problem. And I did that several years ago. I went back to the Philippines. I told my friend, I got to go and, and see Mandaluyong. They all just look at me and I said, I want to get a t-shirt. <laughs> and they thought it was the most craziest thing because it now is back to becoming a, uh, it's still a psychiatric hospital, a very tightly secure control for very severe psychiatric patients. But, but we <laughs> <laughs> but we did <laughs> no but we had no idea that it was basically it was just a building I remember exploring you know around there was um, rice paddy so we would explore I remember one time we um, 
went and picked up these green vegetables that looks like rau muống. You know, we love rau muống, right? So after being there for several weeks, so we pick a bunch, we came home and we cook it. And my youngest brother and sister ate it first and they broke out in a rash. <laughs> it was terrible. So we knew it was a rau muống, but we experimented with a lot of things and just finding ways to eat. Um, why there my parents uh, sold the boat and they divided the money out to you know all their everybody was uh, got a little share and we used that money to uh, buy an outfit to go to America. <laughs> I still remember an overall outfit and everybody got a loaf of bread and a nice outfit so we can go to America. <laughs> wow. Interesting because most of uh, both people they when they get into the so uh, they both got taken by the ah. government. Yeah. yeah, lucky we were able to sell our boat. <laughs> so a they money. Don't Philippines, they know, you know, they don't let that happen. Oh, anymore. so early on they yeah. allow it. They yeah. didn't know. <laughs> we got lucky. lucky. <laughs> okay. How did uh, you and your family go about uh, basically Basically, how did they rebuild their life and how it was difficult for you to uh, assimilate into the foreign education system? We're talking about America. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I don't know any English when I came here. My dad spoke English and so we were very lucky. My mom, friend, Yi Tiu and her husband sponsor us and we live in their basement. And the elementary school I went to was right in front of their house. I remember the first day looking, um, you know, peering out the window, looking across the street to see the school and seeing children in beautiful clothes. In Vietnam, as you know, we were in uniform. Here's just so much color. I just remember that how beautiful that was. Um, I remember, um, you know, not knowing a lot, be, you know, being feeling like an outsider in school. And, uh, but as I was say, I was very good in math. I think in Vietnam, you know, we just, learn math more advanced, so I was just very, very good in math. And then everything else, um, I just listened. And I think after a year, I was able to catch up. I remember, though, I um, didn't like the game dodgeball. I still hate dodgeball today because I was exposed to that when I first came here. I'm like, why would, why would you throw a ball at your friend? That just seems so mean. I just remember that just seems really strange. Um, but my parents worked really hard to uh, regain their education. Uh, my dad had to take, retake the flex exam. Um, so he would at night go um, vacuum, I think at, at Kmart to earn some money. And during the day, he would lock himself in the room. And I remember his room was filled with index cards. You know, he was learning, um, uh, you know, take, trying to prepare for the uh, national medical exam. And he passed that on the first try, which is incredible because I've taken the national medical exam and it's a hard exam. I can't imagine doing that, you know, after a year coming here from Vietnam. And my mom also went back and got her um, education. She didn't go back for her pharmacy degree, but she got a medical technician degree. I forgot to ask you first, what was your feeling when the first time you saw America in the eye? What, what airport did you land to? Believe it, we land in Honolulu. I still have that picture. <laughs> so it was just beautiful. And um, I just remember color, smell, fragrance, just everything looks so clean and orderly. My first time in a supermarket, it's like, you know, you die and gone to heaven. There's so much food everywhere. Um, so just remember just being so clean and so beautiful. You know, we were met by such kindness. we on our flight from Honolulu to Virginia. Um, the pilot of that um, uh, plane actually found out that we were refugee and he came back on the plane and vi visit with us. And my parents still keep in touch with his family. Yeah, yeah so I think it, we just were so lucky to be meet by, by met by such kindness yeah, everywhere. That's really wonderful. What about your sibling? Do they have any difficulty of assembling uh, your life? Or? You know, I think we were so lucky that we came here when we were young enough. My, um, I was nine, my older sister was 11. We're just two years apart. So, uh, you know, nine, 11, seven, and five. So I think we all assimilated okay because uh, uh, we started elementary school here. 
Um, so we we're very fortunate in that way. We learned to speak English by you know, watching Gilligan Island and the Brady Bunch. <laughs> I just remember a lot of those phrases from then. Uh, do you all have any difficulty about the discrimination of kids, you know, Chinese, Japanese, and things like that? P probably initially, but you know, we didn't understand it, so it's okay. <laughs> but I also was m met by incredible kindness. I still remember a girl, I think I was in sixth grade. Her name is Sarah, and she took care of me. So, you know, even though you had kids who didn't, but also there was a lot of kindness as well. So now I like everybody whose name is Sarah. <laughs> um, I think I, I asked you before, but this uh, I would like to go deeper into it is what made you to medical field and, 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 and Air Force? Yeah, I think I always wanted a career that I could help people. So medicine just makes sense. Um, I just enjoy, you know, helping people and I think I just tend to do that well. Um, for the Air Force though, I was in um, college at University of Virginia and I met a friend there. Her name is uh, Mary Beth, Mary Beth Webb, and she was in the Air Force ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps. Um, and she was a very spiritual, just a very loving spirit. And she told me about Air Force ROTC. I didn't know much about you know, ROTC as an opportunity. So I asked her what it was about and she took me to you know, see what they were doing. And I, I really liked it. I, I think I always had a um, very positive sense of the US military. You know, almost a great sense of gratitude that the United States gave us a second chance, a new home. So I thought, huh, if I serve, maybe it's a way to pay back and, and help this country. And um, I remember, you know, taking classes uh, in OTC about military history. And one of our instructors said, you know, nobody loves peace more than the military. And that is so true. You know, people have a different perception that of the military being, you know, we're here to kill. but. I can tell you, nobody loves peace more. It's something we are trained to do, but not certainly something we want to do. Um, so it just resonates so well with me. Um, while I was a young girl in Yajang, I remember um, at a market, I had an encounter with a US uh, military member and he gave me a piece of gum. I think I was lost away from my mom and he just gave me a piece of gum. And so I always joke with my friend, I joined the Air Force because of a nun. Well, my friend, Mary Beth, later on became a Catholic nun after she served four years in the Air Force in the space program. She's now a Catholic nun. So I always say I joined the Air Force because of a nun and a piece of gum <laughs> because it gives me such a positive sense of, um, you know, sense of duty that you're there to serve something greater than yourself. Well, I am so I mind that, well, even a nun and a gum, <laughs> Not in a government. <laughs> a work officer here. Uh, being a very small a woman, uh, do you have any um, your sense of uh, discrimination when you were in a medical field and then Air Force? No, not at all. I think that's the beauty about the U.S. military is that uh, we're all treated very equal. It's based on our performance as a military officer. Um, and I think I never get a sense that because I'm a woman, I can't do this. I just say, you know, what, what is it I want to achieve? Um, and I never felt that because I'm a woman, that, that would hold me back. In fact, it's really funny because I have three boys, and when they were younger, I used to wear, I used to wear um, combat fatigue to work. You know, after 9-11, that's what we wore every day was all combat fatigue. So um, I remember one of my boys uh, used to think that only girls serve in the military because they, they see their mom <laughs> dressing in combat fatigue right. because their friend will ask them, are you going to join the military uh, like your mom when they go up? And they will go, no, only girls serve in the military. <laughs> so I think we put that perception on ourselves that, you know, why is it that you're a woman, you can't do this? That's, that's just something that we, I don't think, should put on ourselves. It's what is it that you want to do in this life and achieve it?
Yeah, that's wonderful, but how about the training? You know, ROTC, I believe that you have to go through a lot of physical training. Yeah, I always like to challenge myself. I remember in uh, college, we had this thing called the drill team where you have to get up at five to practice. And it's a volunteer thing, but I would volunteer for it because I always want to see, you know, what I could do to push my limits. I think being small has it this advantages and disadvantages, right? Because in like in training, we have these things called confidence course, and and sometimes being small, you're able to get through smaller holes easier, quicker. But also being small, um, people may want to throw you over. For example, we had this one scenario where my group had a, a, a very tall wall that we had to figure, and we had a rope on the other side and we had to figure out how to get everybody through this wall and one of the ideas that my group had was well just throw me we can all throw me land over because she is so small i'm like no that's not a good idea <laughs> what's another plan but no i don't think it ever had uh you know held me back because of my size or because i'm a woman or because uh you know i look different than everybody else wonderful i'm so glad to hear that <laughs> I can uh, encourage all girls to join the class. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, can you uh, please tell me about a war you have received? Oh, you know, it, it's funny that in um, I served the military. I never, I never uh, worked to, you know, get promoted. It was never a, a goal of mine to get promoted or to win any award. I only had one goal in every job I had. And in the military, we move every two or three years. So you had a lot of jobs. And um, my goal in every job was to uh, leave it just a little better. You know, just a little better. Because you're there such a short time, you know you can't uh, make big changes. But, and I could say that looking back, that every position, every job I've been, I left it just a little better so that it could be carried on. That is the biggest reward and biggest uh, achievement, I could say. But I believe you received some award. Can you share? Let's see. I don't know if I received any <laughs> Those are minor, I think. I um, really feel like, you know, every, every job, just do your best and figure out a way to make it better. It's never been a goal of mine to receive any award or reward. Okay. So you refuse to share. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell me a little bit about how you met your husband and yeah. then what made you decide to marry him and share a life with him? Um, I met Anthan uh, at University of Virginia. He um, had uh, his family had moved to Charlottesville to start a business and we met, I think, at a a party, a Tet function, a UVA uh, had the Vietnamese Student Association. So every Tet, you know, we had a big party, and I think we met there. And uh, he uh, is just a very kind, loving husband. We've been married for 24 years now. We'll be 25 next year. And I remember telling him, you know, remember I'm in Air Force OTC, so if you marry me, we may have to, you know, move around a lot, travel a lot. And he's been true to his word. You know, he. Uh, left his career, set it aside, and you know, moved with us for 21 years now. So that's why I thought maybe this year is the time that we focus on his career, this time. Wow. Yeah. Um, how do you balance <coughs> your, your family life, your work, your personal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it takes a whole village, everybody. So when I'm not the only one serving the military, my whole family is serving, and you know my parents as well, my aunt and uncle and cousins, because um, you know raising my, remember my first child, I was in residency, so my aunt Yi Ving helped to care of Xander, and then Yi An and Yi Queen, and then um, later on we just the whole. The whole family chip in, and uh, if I had to travel uh, or deploy, my mom would come and help Anthan. So it's been, you know, family helping one another, um, and having a very supportive family, supportive husband. Can um, you tell me how you push the whole village to help you because everybody have family. I know. I think it's uh, it's just part of our family nature. Yeah, we. 
like Lan hosting this here. We just we just do it because uh, I think that's our Vietnamese uh, roots, right? We just help each other because we're family. <laughs> Okay, this time I like for you to describe for me, if you can, your typical day in duty. What you do? Oh, right now? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so I try to get up and um, I try to do some exercise every day. And then uh, right now I have, oh, oh it's funny because my son described. I'll tell you how I see it, and then I'll tell you how my son see it. So I, and then I get to work. I do mostly administrative work now. So I, you know, have to attend a lot of meetings. I help draft policy. I read a lot of our national strategic guidance and translate that to what we need to do. Um, basically, review you know a lot, a lots of documents. Uh, once a week, though, I get to go to Andrews Air Force Base and see patients, and I do acupuncture there so that's like the joy of my week is to be able to see patients when i tell this to my son who's 10 now harrison would say mom all you do is uh sit all day that you have the you have the best job in the world he said you have the easiest and best job in the world because you go from one you sit from one place to sit to the next and when you <laughs> when you see patient you just put some needles in and then you write something and that's it <laughs> so he thinks i have the best job in the world and i do <laughs> you're talking about acupuncture where did you learn it and how what do you think about using acupuncture to patient to kill something is it kill a lot of uh, oh yeah sickness well you know I uh, was exposed to acupuncture when I was in high school I work in my dad's office so he you know got his medical license but also got licensed in acupuncture so in his practice here in Fairfax I will watch as a you know I was only a secretary then I will watch a patient go in in cane or you know a walker and they would just walk out straight like this. So I thought, huh, there's something there. But you know, anything that your dad, your family does, you just think, no, that's nothing. So I've forgotten all about that when I went to medical school and to residency training. It wasn't until after I finished all my training at my first assignment at Pope Air Force Base. I remember I would be seeing pilots who would, you know, had back pain or shoulder pain, and they didn't want medication because sometimes if you give a pilot a medication, they can't fly anymore, and that's their love. You can't do that. So they asked me, is there anything else? And I remember, huh, maybe acupuncture. So I went and got certified in acupuncture on my own at UCLA. Back then, um, UC, um, University of California in LA had a program for physician. So I got certified, and that was in 1997 acupuncture is not being done much in the Air Force um, but luckily for me my commander at that time had been a pilot and he had back pain while he was in stationed in Japan and had received acupuncture in Japan so when I asked him can I do acupuncture here's all the you know training I had he let me do it and I had such great um, success that you know now um, believe it or not the Air Force had embraced acupuncture in fact, we are using acupuncture to, uh, for pain control for patients who are being transported from Germany. You know, a patient got injured in Afghanistan, they fly to Germany, and then they are put on about a 10, 11 hour flight from Germany to Andrews Air Force Base. And if we give them so much narcotics, they become addicted. So now the Air Force is using acupuncture so that they're not having to place on significant um, narcotics. So it's, it's widely embraced in the military. We're also using it to treat post-traumatic stress disorder and in other um, ailments. So it's full being embraced. <laughs> Wonderful. I have to see you after all this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, being a small, bill woman, minority, Vietnamese American, how can you tell a big guy six foot four? Do whatever you want. Uh, you have any body comparison? No, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> oh, in the military, it's your rank. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> just your rank. Yeah, it's funny when I was the um, squadron commander at Kirtland Air Force Base. You know, as a commander, when you walk into the room, everybody stand up. 
so that was strange when you know I first walk in the room everybody stand up I'm like who are they doing that for <laughs> but uh, I think the military was just so trained to respect rank that uh, it's never never an issue size not an issue at all yeah um, you know I, what I love about our Viet Vietnamese heritage being um, born in Vietnam and carrying that heritage and then growing up here in the United States says that you know we are so blessed to embody the wisdom of the East and the confidence of the West. You know, I think we're so lucky to be here in the United States as Vietnamese Americans because we carry both the wisdom and the self-confidence of the West. We, can, uh, we know how to utilize all the best. <laughs> right, and exactly. That's what my dad said when we first came here. He said, you know, we're in a new country. Take what's good about this country and embrace it. Likewise, we will keep what's good about our heritage and continue to apply that. So we, you can pick and choose, right? You pick and choose every day what we want to take as part of us. Yes. Okay, you say a little bit earlier, but I, because this is my list of questions. <laughs> How do your uh, three, five sons feel about having a mom being a colonel in Air Force? <laughs> oh, I think they think of me as mom, oh, you know. Uh, I think they're, they're proud. I think um, they uh, probably like the fact that I'm a physician more because if they need anything, I take care of them. Um, you know, it's not always been easy for our family having to move so much in the military so I know they made a lot of sacrifices as well um, so we do as a family I think they um, see me as a mom not as a physician or <laughs> a colonel yeah. do you think that they can follow your step you know I really encourage my boys to serve whether in the military serve in some way to give back to this country I think um, you know, freedom is so precious that we have to figure out a way to continue to protect it. And if you volunteer to put on the uniform, I think you live it. You, um, you know, serve and give back. So certainly I encourage them, but it has to be their choice. I want it to be their choice. What is your plan for near future, like five years from now, and ten years from now and beyond? Um, <laughs> You know, as a um, physician, I you know, often sit back and, and think about health here in the United States. And as you know, we are not healthy as a nation. We are number one for spending, but we rank, I think, 50 worldwide for health outcome. We're very good for curative care, and if you're very sick, we have ways to treat you, but we don't have ways to maintain your health. We have an epidemic of obesity, diabetes, hypertension. I think nearly one third of all Americans now have high blood pressure. And as a health professional, I worry about that. I worry that uh, we are heading down a path of, um, of um, I think there's a book that just came out uh, that was published, a report that just came out by the National Academy of Sciences that summarized our health status very well. And it's called, uh, Shorter Lives, Poor Health, uh, U.S. Health from an International Perspective. So my next chapter will be folk finding ways to uh, raise that awareness among Americans. Um, I always say if health was an Olympic sport and we ranked 50, we will all rally behind it and, and do something about it. So I want America to wake up we are not healthy as a nation. Healthcare is going to bankrupt us. Um, so that would be my next focus, is figuring out a way to make us healthier as a nation. When you said so, <clears throat> I said so, how you do it? I mean, I think at first is we recognize that we have a problem, <laughs> that we recognize, you know, the epidemic of uh, diabetes is real, that it's not enough to build more dialysis center. We can actually prevent diabetes by eating healthier, by exercising more, that we have to put health in every aspect of our lives. And we as Americans need to demand that we have better, we have health, not just health care, right? There's a big debate about health care, but as citizens, we should all say, 
we want better health, not just health care. Health care is a way to get us there, but we could be healthier. And I think it starts with us individually. Um, exercising, eating healthier, encourage it, each other to be healthier. You know, watching ourselves not to put a lot of nuk mam in our <laughs> food. And, <laughs> yes, so it starts with us uh, as individual, and then as family, and then communities. Yeah. Uh, what about your own family? Yeah, my family in terms of health, I think we're, we're doing pretty good. Uh, we do watch what we eat. My um, dad uh, had um, liver, was diagnosed with liver cancer. I don't know if he wanted me to share this, but um, since then he's you know, turned his life around, had uh, you know, really focused on eating healthier. And then we all do some form of uh, exercise. And my parents do Tai Chi almost every day. Um, my boys all exercise. My husband is much fitter than I am. <laughs> so we uh, certainly want to embody that. And that's really important. In order to be contributing citizens of the, this nation, we have to be healthy ourselves. When the plan puts your family? Oh, find my family? Yeah. Well, in the next five or um, ten years, I want to spend um, more time with my children. I um, want to support my husband in his career. And since my youngest is now 10, he doesn't meet, need me during the school day. So I figure I will have time to you know, figure out a way to help uh, the people of America be healthier. Yeah. So we will have the, the general Million. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It's never been a goal. I always feel I would serve up until a point where where my uh, priority now has to be my family. I want my husband to restart his career. So with that, require us to stay in one place. So we decide to stay here in Virginia. And since we decide to stay in one place, I don't want to go to the Air Force and say, well, I can only serve if you keep me in one place. And I, I told myself I never would get to a point where the Air Force, um, you know, my needs exceed the Air Force and I have to negotiate that way. So it's, it's been a great career. I don't call it retiring, I call it graduating. I'll be graduating from the Air Force because the uh, Air Force has given me tremendous opportunity. Uh, I feel like I've had significant training and experience, and now I would take that to continue to help our country. Do you want to say something that we didn't ask you yet? And can you share that? I would say, you know, I advise others to believe in yourself. You know, we all are here on this earth, I think such a short time. Figure out what your mission in this life is and pursue that. Because every day when we wake up, we should be, uh, we be excited about our work. You have to be passionate. So find that, you know, career path that we are passionate about. Um, and then if you walk that path, then look to mentor others, um, help others who have followed you know, your footsteps, um, encourage them, and give them you know, advice and opportunities. We all can contribute in so many um, different ways. Um, I am just so proud of Vietnamese Americans, um, not only in America, but Vietnamese all over the world. When I read reports about, you know, Vietnamese Australian, Vietnamese Canadian, Vietnamese Netherlands, you know, they're all doing such great things and we're all connected through our roots. But yet we're all over the world and we all adopted, you know, the accent of our, uh, you know, adopted country. I listen to, is it Ando, who's a a comedian. He's a Vietnamese uh, Australian, Vietnamese Aussie comedian. I listened to his uh, uh, show the other day, which is so hilarious to hear a Vietnamese with an Australian accent. And I realized, you know, we're so resilient and we're so adaptable that, you know, wherever we are, uh, we have been very successful. And that's through hard work. And then of all the sacrifices our parents have made for us. And we can't forget that. We can't forget that our parents really gave everything for freedom, the freedom we have today. So I always say, you know, live life with, um, uh, you know, embracing, live life in a way that you embrace uh, liberty and in pursuit of happiness. Just that's the American way. How old you are right now? How old? I'm, no, who are you right now? Who am I? I'm a Vietnamese American. I'd like you to repeat again and slowly because I, I would use a lot of people saying the same thing in my closing. Oh, okay. 
Okay, could you tell me that? Who are you? I'm a Vietnamese American. Are you approve that? No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Unless you want uh, more elaborate. More, more definition. Oh, of what that means? Uh, a Vietnamese, yes. yeah. Just say it again. Who are you right now? Okay. Colonel? I'm a Vietnamese American. And, you know, I thought about this, funny, that just uh, last week we were in uh, Washington, D.C. because the cherry blossom was uh, out. And, you know, those uh, cherry blossom trees were gift from the Japanese, Japanese government to America. And they're now planted on American soil. So in a way, I think I'm a lot like a cherry blossom tree. You know, we came from Vietnam, but we're planted here in America. I don't think the cherry blossom, we asked them, are you Japanese or you're American? They said, they're, they're both. So we all Vietnamese of American. I think we carry a bit of Vietnam wherever we go. And I don't think Vietnam is actually a place. It's actually us, all of us, here. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough, right? Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Unless you want to say No, something. that's okay. good. Thank you. Uh, this is yeah. my last one. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If you have one dream, what your dream would be? Peace. Peace. Yeah, I know we, you and I, and you know most a lot of Vietnamese American born in Vietnam have seen war. We saw war in Afghanistan, Iraq for so many years. I've seen the suffering of war. For my patients, you know, I still do um, clinic, and uh, I have uh, doctors uh, who are not military. They don't wear the uniform. They're civilian. I always tell them that they don't have to deploy to Afghanistan, Iraq to see the conflict and war because in medicine, the war comes home. They see the suffering every day in the clinic, in our troops. So if we, if we see that, why wouldn't we strive for peace? So I just want peace. Thank you very much.